welcome to the month end of CPG Community Chat. The month end will provide emerging CPG brands real life knowledge into the accounting, finance, and operational worlds. Our guests will be key stakeholders from those same brands as well as other key contributors to the industry. Welcome to episode 38 of the month end podcast. Today we have Tom Malengo from Brand Jectory. How are you doing today, Tom? Good, Brad. Thanks for having me here. Happy to happy to chat with everyone. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to uh, learning more about your background and what Be- Brand Jectory does, but also kind of discuss a lot of the uh, experience and knowledge and foresights that you have within the CPG space for what over three, four decades here. So, is that right? Um, ten where we've been working in it fully, and and uh, another twenty plus where we were uh, very much advocates of this industry and and getting to know it and learn it and be part of it. Awesome. Well, we'll uh, chat about how things have changed the last several decades, but let's get started. Just go ahead, give us your background and kind of like, you know, walk us through those kind of last several decades and kind of what what you do within the space as well as then once you uh, talk about that, let's talk about brand trajectory. Okay. Well, uh, story, my story is very simple. I had a, a corporate career in banking for 30 years at a, at a nation, national, national bank, um, 20 of that at the sea level. I uh, had a chance to uh, take a buyout. Um, uh, my wife, Susan Bryanton, said uh, no more uh, winners in Cleveland, and we moved to Scottsdale. Um, but as we were discussing before, Brad, um, Susan and I were lifelong foodies. Uh, we were the type in the late 80s, early 90s, were running around looking to try to figure out how to eat healthy. Um, we were kind of doing that, hey, we're going to eat for the for the, for the the for the health of our whole full life, um, you know, and, and watch ourselves. And we kind of grew up with the industry, even though we had other careers. Um, we kind of grew up with the industry. So we thought were those early advocates of brands like Pamela's and Barbara's and and Amy's and and uh, Annie's. You have to be older than yourself to know that to know those. Um, you know, but this was a time when pirate's booty was considered better for you, okay, yeah, you know, yeah. because there wasn't anything like that on the market. Um, so we, you know, we did road trips places, and if we saw Whole Foods because we didn't have one in Cleveland, you know, we would stop and load up the car and buy stuff. So when we had that chance for a second career, we wanted to work with young brands. And so we thought we could take our business skills and our knowledge of the industry. And we were the type that were going to trade shows in the industry before we were part of the industry. We were going for fun to learn new products um, because we just, you know, so we knew people. So we decided to invest, advise, and consult with young brands. And we did that for a number of years. And then we, we, we continued to want to bring more of what emerging brands needed um, in terms of the knowledge of the CPG industry. So many brands get into CPG, so many founders get into CPG, and they're not, they're not CPG experts. They're, they're really coming out from other industries. Or it's, their first, it's their first take at being an entrepreneur, and CPG is a little bit different. I mean, investors look at things different. There's a different way of dealing with folks. And we wanted to bring some of that to as many people as possible. And with some partners, we formed Brandjectory, which is basically an education and engagement platform for brands in CPG. If it's in the Whole Foods, it can be on in Brandjectory, on Brandjectory for brands under 10 million in sales. So we want to be that seed to series A sort of lifetime accelerator for a brand. So where you might get 13 weeks in an incubator, an accelerator if you get accepted of intense mentoring and 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 contacts and connections. We want to be there for the life of a brand. And that's why we offer Brandjectory as sort of the accelerator that's going to help you throughout those growth stages, meet the right people, talk to the right people, get to know the right people, and maybe really sort of speed up your overall growth um, by learning the CPG industry, making more contacts in the CPG industry, and hopefully avoiding some of the down the down the downturns that you might run into by not knowing who to turn to and who to ask the question of. Love it. Great background there. Um, um, that's really going to set the stage for this conversation today. So uh, initially, we're talking like zero to $10 million companies, you know, as, as you're mentioning here. How do you from your kind of experience, like, how do you typically segment that zero to 10, right? Because there's different phases within that, like, do you guys segment that at all? Or how would you view that as like zero to one, one to five, five to 10? Or like, is there a kind of a, a template that you guys use? Not really a template, but you know, we we do want to make sure that when we're trying to help people connect or when we're counseling them or working with them, yeah, there's a difference when you're talking to a brand under a million in sales. Okay. There's a difference in what angel investors are going to look at as opposed to a growth investor. If you're at three million, you know, two to four million in sales, you're going to get a growth investor who's going to want a different, is going to take a different perspective on your brand. 
And certainly when you get into that six, seven, eight million dollar range and you're starting to say, hey, maybe it is time for a Series A or a real priced offering, you know, then you're really saying it's more about just the product. It's more about how you get on and off the shelf. It's more than, you know, just how you're managing your cost. It starts to becoming what's your business structured like? Do you have the right people in place? Do you have the right tasks and priorities lined up for your business? So there's different stages of growth and there's different, you know, perspectives of what an angel investor is going to think about you versus what that growth investor is going to think about you or that bridge round investor that's going to get you to the series A. Definitely. Definitely. Kind of very, very similar to how um, I visualize and, and and kind of walk through it. So from an, uh, a brand that's starting out zero to 1 million, you know, maybe on a 250 K to 500 K annual run rate, what are a couple of the kind of key things that are KPIs are just key factors or key initiatives that they should be focused on at that level. So, so number one is 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 product and knowing that that product is connecting with the, the clients. You don't have a lot of consumers yet. I mean, you really don't. You may be in, you know, a, a, a thirty regional stores, and and they may not be Whole Foods. They may be a couple of independents. They may be some small cafes. Who knows? Okay, but you need to know and you need to understand and be able to say. People are finding me for this reason, and they're coming back and selecting my product for this reason. And here's how often that's happening. To me, that's number one. And when I talk to brands that size, I want to make sure they understand why that consumer is selecting them and what it is that's happening when the, when the consumer connects with that product. You need to make sure that product fits what all investors are looking for right now, which is quality, value, functionality, okay? Because that's what consumers want. Consumers want to know that if if they're fine if they're paying $8.99, I'm making a number up, for a product that fits all of that because it fits their lifestyle, okay? But they don't want to be paying that for a product that doesn't have the proper qualities, the proper functionality, or delivering the value that it's intended to deliver. So if I'm buying a functional drink that is going to give me energy, I want to feel like that's happening. So to me, that's number one for those small brands. The second part of that is know what it's costing you. Now, this matters at all stages, but at this stage, you're going to be trying to convince somebody to invest in you because you're going to get better. Okay? And if you're going to get better, you need to know how those costs are going to change as you add stores, as you add production. You know, every every founder wants to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, my, my costs are going to improve as I get volume. Why? What's going to change? What's going to change in your supply line? What's going to change in your production line? What's going to change in terms of the cost that it gets to put, it takes to get you on the shelf? What's going to change in the cost that it takes to get you off the shelf? All these things you have to be understanding to be able to convince somebody, especially a larger private angel, okay, who understands it. We're, we're not just investing as, I'll make up a word here, charity, okay, because we like the product and we really want to see the product succeed. They're starting to think of you as a business. You need to be able to explain those things. So to me, those are the two things that matter the quality of the product, the, the, the efficacy of the product, and that you know your costs and understand what that means as you grow your business. Nobody, as much as we tell everybody, everybody's focused on profitability, investors are focused on profitability. At this stage, they're focused on when you're going to be profitable, not necessarily if you are. They understand that. So those are the two things that are going to tell, start to tell them, you know the product can get so big, and if it gets that big, do you have a path to profitability? Love it. So then as, um, as you grow to the kind of the next phase of the, let's say, million to three million-ish range, what are the additional things that then you would be looking for that company to, to be handling? Then I, I really think you have to, you know, besides those two things, you have to really start understanding, you know, what you're delivering and what you're, what you're actually making from that. You have to start thinking about ROI of all your investments. So you have to start thinking, because at this point in time, you're, maybe you're starting to contract with people to do your sales. Maybe you're actually starting to use a distributor. Maybe you're starting to do some, you know, something with a broker. Maybe you're, you know, maybe, maybe you're starting to figure out that there's, you know, you can offer a different flavor. Um, you know, oh, you have the opportunity to go into a store this size. How much is it going to cost you? You have to understand these additional parameters that are really starting to show the investor that you know how to grow this business. Still a big difference between 1 million and 3 million, okay? You know, there's a huge gap there, you know, and you need to be careful in terms of, you know, I've seen a lot of brands, there are 2 million sales. Hey, Costco took us, 
we're at four million in sales this year. Next year they're back to two million because Costco manages everything. If it, I mean, if they can get three more pennies out of every every square inch of of space on that shelf, they're going to get those three pennies, and you're out. So you have to be thinking. You have to start thinking long term about your business and about how each and everything you invest in, every hire you make, every um, uh, every advertising plan you take on pl on place, every all your trade spend. You have to start thinking wisely about what's that getting you. Because you got to have that growth continue. You can't just, you know, spike and stay, spike and stay. You want to show you can continue to grow. Deep is always better than wide. Everybody will say that, but it really is true. Your bang from your buck will come when you're across Southern California. Because guess what? You can show the investor that every number in every store is moving together. You can start to show them that you understand the differences between Air One and Whole Foods, that you understand the difference between Gelson's and 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 Bristol Farms, you know, and, and using Southern Cal as, a, as an example. But once you can start showing the investor that you understand those things, they know you can go into Boulder and Denver. They know you can go into Northern California. They understand you can start to move out. But you have to show that the supply chain, your production chain, your inventory management skills, which you're going to help us talk to the brand Jeckery crowd about next week. And everybody's welcome to join that. You know, these are things you have to, at this stage, start to show that you can manage and that you can drive yourself more closer, nearer, you know, on target for some level of profitability. Um, two, two kind of follow-ups from that. Number one, deep versus wide. So again, just to even go through the different tranches, the zero to one, the one to three, whatever, like, we have some brands that come to us that are like, hey, can you guys do my accounting, bookkeeping, all that type of stuff. They're $250,000 run rate, but yet they're in, they sell in Mabel Fair, Shopify on their website, Amazon, trying to get through distribution and then direct wholesale, maybe even some food service. So they're on like 58 sales channels. <laughs> and just the pure time it spends on accounting and bookkeeping is like, it's a lot of money to, to kind of manage that. So like, what do you typically tell people when they start out to kind of go through it and, and, and you know, re recommend to them as they move forward with their business? You know, you know, I, I guess it's always, you know, concentrate, you know, concentrate on the, uh, you know, on, on the areas where, you know, and, and I'm making up numbers here. But, you know, if, if you know you can get the 10 stores, the four stores, the 12 stores, the 24 stores, you know, in an area, you start to really build something that becomes very solid. And very thorough you you are you are covering an area you know it have different you know even in one area consumers are different you can talk to different consumers you learn how different stores you know react to you on the shelf you start to manage the things you say about reorders from this store versus versus reorders from that store you know um you know you start to really get that feel for i'm growing at a substantial pace and i know it because then if somebody comes to you and says, hey, we're going to add 50 stores, you know, we're Whole Foods, we're going to add 50 stores, you're already in 50, it's not that big a leap. To go from five stores to 50 stores or five stores to 75 stores, that's a big leap. You don't know how to manage that. You don't know how to care for it. You don't know how to watch it. You don't know how to measure it. So my, my goal with folks is usually to say, start working on those small, regional, local, you know, um, uh, local uh, uh regional stores build it that way now that's different if you're in new york city you can do that all through independence you know you know maybe they have one maybe they have two maybe they have three but there's a lot of different ways to do that you have to look at your market and say what's that way that i can get to that number of maybe 50 or, or 75 stores so you really start to feel like you're managing a business um great great insight there uh my other follow-up question is regarding forecasting, modeling, knowing your numbers, uh, knowing the ROI of when you hit a specific kind of aspect of your business, because this is always an interesting one, right? Like, hey, I created this forecast. Again, I'm a 500K runner rate client. I created this forecast for the next three to five years, the whole Shark Tank thing. Like, what does it mean? We have no idea, right? And, 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 and how do you make really decisions off it? So I guess my question with, with, with this is, number one is clearly... People need to know their numbers from a unit economic standpoint. They should know their numbers from just basic financials, p &L, you know, what's in my bank account, the whole nine yards as a basic small business. At what point does a forecast over 12 months really matter and really can yield good strategic decision-making for a brand? 
in terms of revenue size, to me that that starts to happen when you're over a million in sales. I, I think any any brand that's under a, um, a million in sales, you 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 know that 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 next you're always just looking for that next opportunity, the next boat place to get on the shelf, the next place to start showing some increase, those kinds of things. When you get over a million in sales and you've had you know a year or a year and a half with some retailers, you understand those reorder rates. You know who's potent. You really understand who's potentially coming in the coming year. This is when that forecast, at least that twelve month forecast, starts to really make sense. I mean, if you're under a million in sales, the chances are you have very, you still have very few retailers who have been on there for six months, a year, a year and a half. That you really can tell the the, the run rate and the reorder rate. Once you're over a million, your brand's been around maybe two years, a year and a half, two years, you start to get a feel for what's consistent, what's at risk. Okay, how do you expand that consistency to the next to the next retailer? How do you start to grow that? Who's the potential target? Because the consumer is alike, the company behaves the same way, they have the same necessity for the product on the shelf, they want you in the same kind of space. I mean, how many people have I been? They've, they've been excited. They got in Sprouts. They're at the end of the aisle, and there is a hanger covering them up. Okay, and you know they're they're new, and they're not going to be found. And and you know this is where you have to understand these things, and you have to be in a position to be able to say to yourself, hey, to say that to that buyer, hey, we were in Gelson's, and we were here in the shelf against these brands. Okay, and we sold this. You don't want us there. You want us here. This is where you want us because we have that proven success. You need those things not just to be able to get that set, to get that that buyer to buy you, but to be able to forecast properly to know I'm going to see some similar kinds of results that I can live to, that I can manage to, I can monitor, and I can figure out what's going wrong if it doesn't work. Is there any um, specific... Um things that you look at from an aspect of type of entity structure, LLC, C Corp, um, different things like that from a legal or a tax standpoint that impacts any of your like uh, in brand directories, like investment decisions or, or even just across the, you know, the, the landscape from an angel investor to a, you know, a more of an institutionalized investor. Uh, my answer to that is not really, and that's not a cop, <laughs> okay, you know, um, I've seen investors who, you know, still want you to be an LLC when they get involved at a higher level. They're, they're not they they don't want a corporate structure. They don't want to deal with that. Um, I've seen, you know, others brands whose attorneys and and tax accountants have recommended they go to become a S corp or a C corp um, for a variety of reasons that make sense. Certainly, there are brands that go to become a B corp for those reasons. Um, so I don't. I, I'm I'm going to say I don't really think it matters. Okay. Um, because it, it really depends on the situation for each brand and the kind of investors you're dealing with. If, if you're under three, four million in sales, most of the investors you're, you're going to be dealing with are going to be thinking you're an LLC. Okay. It's just not a, it's just not a big deal. Um, yeah. When you get up there to six or 7 million, there are reasons you may want to be a S corp or a, a, a C corp. There are reasons that you may want to do that then. But I think a lot of it comes down to what you're thinking about in terms of your Series A round, a priced offering, how that's going to work, who are going to be your targets. Um, so to me, that's, and I'm not the tax expert or the legal expert, but to me, when you're when I'm talking to a brand and they ask me that question, kind of the answer I give them is, you know, who's going to be that next level investor and what they're going to expect um, and who are you targeting? Because I think that's what matters most in that situation. What do you what do you expect from um, uh, from a financial reporting accounting standpoint for a small emerging brand? What would you expect? Just like the deliverable service, things like that, that, you know, as you're looking at from a, a investment or just the overall success of a company. I want to make sure. And again, I, I want the standard information, you know, P&L, uh, 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 um, an income state, you know, the, the, the income statement, the balance sheet. Um, uh, you know, the, 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 the cap table, um, uh, a three year for at least a three year forecast for whatever, for whatever value it serves. I want to see those things. I want to know they're doing it on a regular basis. I want to know that they're, they're using an accountant that, you know, is, is, is giving them, you know, the accurate information about how to present that stuff. 
I want to make sure they work through the details of their trade spend. I want to make sure they work through the details of how they're paying people and when they're paying people. Um, I want to know what they're leaving on the table when it comes to losses. I want to look at all those things, but I want to know they can produce those things every 90 days, you know, and that they can close their books and there's a monthly statement behind each of them. I want to make sure they know how to do those things and that they're doing those things. Um, and, and the biggest thing a brand can do is, is at any level is treat all investors the same. You know, if, whether it's an investor that's, you know, 5,000 bucks into you or 500 bucks into you, or when you have an investor that's a million or 2 million into you, you want to make sure you're treating them, they're investors, treat them like investors, treat them with the, with the, the, you know, that they need to know these things about your business, about how you're taking care of their, their investment and make sure you're doing these things on a regular basis. When those things start to fail, investors start to get worried um, and they start to show and indicate that you may not have a handle on everything that's happening. And, you know, whether it's chargebacks that you can't account for, or it's account, it's a, it's account payables, you're not getting, whatever it is, You've got to be on top of all that, manage it on a regular basis. What um, would you say, as we kind of go back in the landscape of the last couple of decades, there are several decades that you've kind of been involved in this space. What are the, just in general, the two biggest, two to three biggest kind of differences today, not specifically related to like how the, you know, economic times the last kind of 12, 18 months, but just in general, the last five or six years, how does the last five or six years, even before COVID to now comparative you know, late nineties, early two thousands or whatever, just from the, uh, within the CPG kind of landscape. You know, I think the, the, I think what's, I think there's two, been two big changes. Okay. The first is product quality, the product itself. Um, you know, if you think back to the, the differential between some of the products I measured and everything else that was on the market, you know, those early me, those early products I discussed, Barbara's and Pamela's and, and Annie's and Amy's, they were better than the other things on the pro on the market. Okay, you know I I'm a I'm a 1960s 1970s kid. I have no idea what was that in that instant pudding my mother made. Okay, <laughs> you know it was probably the same thing as the metal bottle you're drinking out of right now. Yeah. You know, um, so I have no idea. So you know there was a big differential and gap between that. But I think then up until a few years ago, product cleanliness, product you know, uh, simplicity really, really matter. Okay. Um, I think what's happened and, and maybe this is more opinion than anything else, Brad, I think what's happened to try to push growth. Okay. I think there's a lot of products that tend to slip a little bit on cleanliness, slip a little bit on organic, slip a little bit on some of the things, simplicity in order to be more accessible to mainstream conventional stores price it right, get on the shelf, get the turnover. And I think that's one of the things that's happened. You know, so, you know, when I would say, you know, 10 years ago, it was really about, is it clean? Does it have any emulsifiers? Does it, you know, is it, is it carrying any, you know, chemicals, things like that? You know, there's still a lot of that, but I think it's changed a little because people want growth and growth isn't necessarily going to happen through the natural channel. It's going to have to happen outside of that. And, you know, with players like Costco, and Amazon and Walmart picking up so much of the grocery uh, channel, you have to understand what that means in terms of your growth and your ability to attract capital. So to me, that's a big part of the things that change. And I think the other one is, you know, the the it's probably a, an outcome of social media, okay? It may be an outcome of products like Liquid Death, okay? Where it's become more about the brand than the differential or the, uh, the the cleanliness of that brand or that product compared to others. It's become more about, you know, is it a story? Is it a lifestyle fit? Is it a, you know, is, is it, is it a marketing opportunity? You know, how does it fit and play in that social media world? I mean, we've seen the, the products that have gotten funding because of a great TikTok campaign and that's fine. That's great. Um, you know, car companies have done this well for a hundred years, right? They know how to sell a car. They don't want to make it shiny and glitzy and get it in front of people. And so nothing wrong with that. But I think the emphasis has come that if you can't tell that story the right way, and if you can't, if you can't put your brand in sort of that, it has to be part of my life feeling, um, more so than just a health perspective or a, a goodness perspective to me. If you can't put it in that perspective of this is important, I feel good holding it in my hand, 
I feel good when my friends see it with it, me with it. You know, I'm, I'm, I, they know I'm doing something good for myself because they know the brand that starts, I think, become very important. So I think those are the two big changes that I've seen that have really taken place over maybe the last five years. And then separately, what about the last kind of 12 to 18 months with, um, you know, from the the, the funding, um, the capital, you know, markets, uh, how these zero to $10 million kind of CPG brands have been impacted? What is your take on kind of the what's changed then? And then as well as like kind of moving forward, how, how are brands, you know, maybe managing their business differently than they were two years ago? You know, and again, probably this, this could probably be a whole podcast in itself. So I'll try to sh- try to keep it short. Um, I'm an economic nerd. I, I was a, a math and econ major, so I'm an economic nerd. Um, you know, I, I think, of course, with everything that's gone on, money has sat on the sidelines. There is no doubt that there's a lot of money sitting, waiting to be invested. Interest rates have been high. And investors, especially the private angels, have seen, you know, see better return, safer return, let's say it that way, in instruments that are at a nice high interest rate. I think a lot of people felt this year would be one where that money would free up as interest rates have fallen. We've seen what's happened just in the first two months. You know, the March interest rate drop is is out out of the out of the out of the picture. Inflation's starting to climb back up after January. Um, the Fed's starting to talk about maybe not June. Uh, Fed's starting to say no soft landing. So I think this year is still going to be a very cautious year. For what I will call, you know, young money. Okay, the 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 investors who will invest in young in young brands, emerging brands. I think it's going to be a, still a tough year. Okay, I think that's why it's important for every brand to focus on the essential, you know, business building blocks that we talked about, the kind you offer, the kind Brand Jeffrey offer, you know, to make sure they have that strong business, um, because I think it's just going to be that tight environment. I think that could change. Um, if we see a little bit of difference in, in how money's being deployed out there, it becomes a little scary when you see days like this in the stock market. If you're old enough to have lived through the 90s and early 2000s and had money invested and see what happens when there's small short term bubbles. So I think that's well, it's great. There's a, it's a little bit scary. Um, so I think, you know, it's still a time to be cautious and work on business fundamentals. The end of the year may show us something different. Uh, there's a risk out there. Um, you know, inflation started to curb uh, late last year a little bit, started to come down on a monthly basis. But over the last 60, 70 years of, of history, um, a high bout of inflation over mid-teens or higher always results in another spike after it comes down within a, within 12 months. So it's not surprising that we may see a little bit of creeping of inflation over the next six to eight months. And then, you know, maybe that's when it starts to straighten out. Um, but if those rates keep going up, if those inflation rates keep going up, the, the Fed's not going to be cutting interest rates and investor money isn't going to free up. That's sort of my take on what the situation is now. Build a strong business. Yeah. yeah. You're smiling. So I think you kind of agree with me. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just waiting for the, uh, I'm excited for the, <clears throat> the hour long lecture here next week is uh, back uh, from <laughs> Professor Tom right here. That was great. <laughs> um, one last question. <laughs> I'm going to get into kind of our final kind of uh, sign off kind of questions here. So just do you have a, like a brand directory, like alumni, like success story and uh, of a brand or somebody that uh, you guys helped and kind of what, why sure, they were there, a success? Yeah, sure. There's been a lot of them, but uh, one person I'll point out is uh, Jason Bauer from original crumbs, uh, uh, bake shop. Um, uh, uh, New Yorkers will remember that this was a, uh, very um uh uh they were they were around the city as a as a bake shop um uh brad and his wife sold the, uh jason and his wife sold sold the brand uh the who they sold it to closed it up eventually they rebought the brand back and they started as a retail brand um he came to a couple of our founder investor meetups um i think it was august of 22 and uh, the investor invited him to a couple of uh, angel group meetings, and he raised uh, 50000 from each of them. And then just recently, um, in January here, he used, um, he used our Warp Drive service, where we do a little bit of, inter- uh, of more intense introduction for him. Um, and uh, he raised another 100000 So, you know, this, this is what we're looking for. We are a very low-priced option for brands to get access to us and to our materials. Um, we are an education and engagement platform. We do that through a series of meetings and ways in which they connect with industry experts. They get our counseling, our guidance, 
Um, but we do that at a very low price. We're a subscription service. Um, we're not a broker dealer. We take no equity. We take no success fees. We're simply an option for them to learn the CPG business, actually meet and engage with people, learn directly from investors and from industry experts. Um, you know, we have meetups where we have folks from Anshin. We'd love to have you. We have folks from Anshin there um, and investors. And we talk about, you know, things like cost, cost, uh, uh, cost maintenance and contribution margin. And we take it from an investor perspective and from an accounting perspective. We did the same this this week, month with Nutter, with folks from Nutter, Jeremy Halpern and Will Barnett. And um, we did that talking about term sheets and how to navigate term sheets. We had a couple of investors talk about it too. This is the kind of thing we do. This is why we've asked you to come next week and talk about inventory management. Um, because these are all the things that help a brand build a good business, okay? And put them in a position to win. And um, these, you know, and, and that's how we price our services so that people have access to that and get success. Love it, love it. So as we uh, sign off here, um, we kind of have two um, questions we always ask. So the first one, what is one CPG business do? So can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, what is one CPG business do? So the two questions are, what does one do and what does one don't? Oh, so oh, oh, I get it, okay. Um, you know, when it comes to do, it, it may be too broad an answer, um, but what a CPG brand needs to do always is, is understand their business and figure out the people who are going to engage with their business and believe in the mission of their business. Okay. So whether it's trajectory or accountfully, you know, as a service provider, whether it's a partner you're bringing on, whether it's an investor, you want to know people are behind your mission, that they see your vision, and 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 and, and in some ways they're in love with your vision. Okay, they want you, you want people that want to be a part of that success that see it that way. And I think as any brand grows, as any brand thinks about those kinds of things, they want to make sure they're meeting and dealing and working with people who understand that mission, just aren't providing a service that they really understand their mission. And when they think about providing a service, they're thinking about it in terms of, you know, this is, you know, this, this, this person believes in me and is going to give me answers and, and opportunities and suggestions that reflect my business. That's what we do at Brandjectory for a brand. Brand comes in and does the work that they need to do, you know, comes to the meetings, you know, fills out their profile. We try to make sure we're guiding them based on their mission and where they want to go and what they want to succeed. And I think brands need to do that when it comes to the, what they don't, what they shouldn't do. I, I think th there's a couple things here, but I think the big one is, you know, that they really need to understand. And I, I go back to something I said before, they need to understand who their customer is, who they're talking to. Okay. And if they don't do that, you know, if they just go out there and continue to build, grow, you know, you know, get get retailers, you know, say, OK, I got an opportunity for a bunch of independents. I think they run the risk. They run the risk of I think it was what you, you know, they end up in too many sales channels. OK, you know, um, I've seen brands that, you know, they, they wanted to say, hey, we've got, you know, we've got 30 skew, different SKUs and we're on 10,000 stores. And I, you know, and I, I asked the question, well, can you show me the cost margin on each one of them? OK, well, no, they couldn't. Okay, so you don't know which ones are selling and which ones are getting, you know, you, you need to understand your growth. And most brands are so focused on revenue and on growth that they stop thinking about it as a business and they stop thinking about how do I make this a solid business? So don't grow for the sake of growth, grow because it makes sense for your business. Yeah, and even within that, I would also add, um, and when you're growing your business, understanding that you need to segment your business by sales channel to understand, like the the profitability, the success of each brand, uh, excuse right. me, of each sales channel, as well as SKU. Right. And if you don't have that level of segmented data, uh, segmented data, then it's a really hard uh, process to decide how to move forward in, in the most efficient manner. So. Um, well, this was great. Um, Tom Malengo from Brandjectory, episode 38 of the Month End Podcast. Tom, before we leave, where can we find you in Brandjectory? www.brandjectorynow.com. If you have any questions, it's tom at brandjectory.com. Um, and and um, um, certainly you can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can connect with me um, uh, with Brandjectory on Twitter. 
Um, my wife and partner is Susan Bryanton, and she's Susan at Brandjectory.com. Uh, but you can go to www.brandjectorynow.com and, and read all about everything I've talked about. Um, you can see our event calendar. We have some great events coming up. Um, one with uh, Brad right there. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we try to bring, you know, the best of, of everything we can to the brands that are on Brand Jectory. So um, look us up. And if you have questions, please reach out. Awesome, Tom. Thanks for your time. And I uh, hope the audience enjoys all the information we chatted about today. Take care. Thank you so much. I hope this, uh, hope this was what you and your uh, folks that are listening to this needed to hear. Thanks a lot for having us.